All right. Well, good afternoon, Rotary District 7770, and welcome to Conversations with Rotary Action People for Wednesday, January 27th. My name is Donald Hovis. I am your CRAP host, and I'm from the Chicora Rotary Club in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. We're pleased to be joined this afternoon by South Carolina State Attorney General, Mr. Alan Wilson. Alan, we're excited to have you. We look forward to your talk here in just a few minutes. Um, I will do a few announcements, followed by your bio, and then we'll get started. So uh, introducing your CRAP team, she is uh, very much responsible for setting up today's speaker and setting up all the speakers for our CRAP program from the Five Points Rotary Club in Columbia, the wonderful Mary Gass. Mary, thank you for what you do. Those of you on the Zoom call, thank you for being here, fellow Rotarians. I want you to go to the chat box. I want your name, your Rotary Club, and Mary, there's several in the waiting room. Um, and uh, I want you to, um, today's National Chocolate Cake Day. I don't know if you're a chocolate cake fan, but today happens to be National Chocolate Cake Day. So if you are a fan of chocolate cake, put that in the chat box as well. All right, so here is South Carolina State Attorney General Alan Wilson's bio. Alan is now serving in his third term as South Carolina's Attorney General after being reelected in November 2018. He has also served in the National Guard for 23 years, including a combat tour in Iraq, and is now the Army Judge Advocate General for South Carolina. As Attorney General, he has focused uh, on fighting human trafficking with a report in 2019 ranking our state as the best in the nation for improving its human trafficking laws and last year's report showing continued improvement in fighting that crime. Allen has led on numerous national issues and has sued the federal government, both Democratic and Republican administrations, to keep South Carolina from becoming a plutonium dumping ground he has also fought against frivolous lawsuits that target manufacturers. Wilson's has, Wilson has led the fight for relief for utility uh, ratepayers, arguing the Base Load Review Act was unconstitutional and demanding full rate relief. He has also been involved in protecting South Carolina's coast from seismic testing and offshore drilling. Folks, Give a warm welcome to South Carolina State Attorney General, Mr. Alan Wilson. Alan, good afternoon, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate that. I see, I see all the clapping, so I wish I could hear it, but I, I see it. First off, thank you so much for allowing me to be here. Happy uh, Chocolate Cake Day, everybody. Um, I, I didn't know that was a thing, but um, that's good to know that there is something like that. First off, um, as someone who has also been a, a member of Rotary in the past and is, and is as I've traveled the state, one of my favorite things to do as attorney general is to travel to various Rotary clubs. And I used to, when I was active in my, uh, I was a founder in the West Metro Rotary Club, I used to travel around the country or travel around the state and give the flags uh, and, and bring flags back to my home club. So I've always loved Rotary as an organization. I grew up going to Rotary clubs with my dad, who's a lifelong Rotarian, uh, probably since I was the age, you know, six or seven years old. So for over 40 years, I've been attending Rotary clubs. And in my mid-20s, I actually became a Rotarian in my own right. And I know my brother, as Mary said earlier, for those who were um, on, online earlier, um, my brother is, is, a, is a member of the Five Points Rotary Club. So it, it's a bit, it's an important organization. One, one little point of comic relief, I remember one of our founders of our hometown Rotary Club that I was a member of, uh, he's now deceased, but he used to always joke because um, we'd always do the four-way test. You know, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concern? Will it build goodwill and better friendship? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? He used to always ask me, well, you know, the five-way test. And I said, no. And, and of course, he would go through all four. And then he would say, and the last one was, will I get caught? And, uh, and I always used to think that was somewhat funny. But uh, what, what I'm here to talk to you all about today is something that's really not very funny. Um, when I ran for attorney general in 2010, I, I ran on a, on a lot of platforms, uh, board planks in my platform, rather, you know, public safety, things like that. But the one thing that I never never one thing I never said in my 2010 election that I never actually recognized was a real problem because I was just ignorant of it was human trafficking. In fact, when I was elected in 2010 and took office in 2011, um, 
I, I, there was no human trafficking statute on the books in South Carolina. Um, I, I just, I wasn't aware that it was a real problem. And I think when most people think of human trafficking, they think of something like a, like a, a Hollywood movie. Uh, one older movie that comes to mind is an old movie about with Liam Neeson called Taken. Uh, you know, and it's an action movie, whereas he's, you know, assassin for the CIA, whose daughter's kidnapped by human traffickers in Eastern Europe. And he spends the whole two hours of the movie tracking the guys who, who kidnapped his daughter overseas and he kills everybody and gets his daughter back. It's an entertaining movie. But, you know, like what Hollywood does is, is they kind of they kind of stereotype a crime or they stereotype something into making you think that it's something that only happens to certain kinds of people by certain kinds of people in certain places. And if you don't fall into a particular socioeconomic um, status or if you don't have a belong to a certain ethnic or racial group or, you know, uh, that you won't be victimized by it, or you know, you have to be kidnapped in order to be trafficked. And of course, th those stereotypes were were kind of imprinted on people. And they were certainly imprinted on me. But what I quickly learned about human trafficking, and I always like to give international statistics first, because it's not just a local problem. You know, it is an international problem. When you look at human trafficking as a crime internationally, it is a 150 billion dollar a year industry. That's billion with a B. 150 billion dollars. The World Health Organization estimates there are probably around 40, 41 million victims of human trafficking every year worldwide. The United States is the number one destination for human trafficking. Um, when you look at the United States, uh, one in seven runaways for purposes of statistics uh, is, is a victim of human trafficking. It is the fastest growing criminal enterprise in our country. It is second only in terms of um, drug trafficking. So it, it's a pretty highly ranked crime. When you look at South Carolina, if we go from international to national to regional, South Carolina as a state sits between two of the top 20 human trafficking hubs in the country. That is Charlotte and Atlanta. So if you're in the upstate, the I-85 corridor, that's a major artery. If you're looking at I-77 um, from Columbia all the way up, the show, there's another artery there. And then when you look at the I-95 corridor, that, you know, it's been called the corridor of shame when talking about education, but it's a corridor for other things because a lot of people along the Eastern seaboard, you know, sex trafficking in, in, in heavily trafficked areas uh, like um, Myrtle Beach and Charleston and areas like that where there's a lot of tourism. Uh, and then in even more rural areas, you might have, a, you still have sex trafficking, but you might also have labor trafficking. You have a lot of undocumented um, people in this, in this state um, who were kind of off the grid, which means that they're low hanging fruit for someone to exploit. Um, so th these were issues that our state started to talk about in 2011. In 2012, we advocated for and the General Assembly gave us the Human Trafficking Act. The Human Trafficking Act uh, was passed in 2012. We were fined it again in 2013 by giving authority to the state grand jury to go after human traffickers. But with the Human Trafficking Act is a codified it, it took South Carolina, it, it codified human trafficking as a crime and, and made it a more robust criminal package. In other words, we can go after folks, not just criminally, but civilly for trouble damages. We can go after them and, and disgorge businesses who support and participate in human trafficking efforts and, and give those monies to victim efforts. Um, it, gives us, uh, the, it gives us teeth uh, in law enforcement to go and tools for law enforcement to go after human traffickers. It also created the, human, the State Human Trafficking Task Force, which is housed under the Office of the Attorney General. When the task force was created in 2012, it was, it was originally uh, had uh, 11 mandated members. We had four federal agencies uh, that were invited to participate, and they did. And that was like the, the Justice Department, the U.S. Attorney's Office, the FBI, ICE was, was very much involved. The Department of Labor was involved as well. And then we had 11 state agencies, in, uh, including two nonprofit organizations that serve uh, victims' needs. But that, that list has grown over the last eight years to over 450 participants in the State Human Trafficking Task Force. The task force is kind of a multidisciplinary task force. Um, it's not just law enforcement. It has victim services providers in it, both nonprofit and um, governmental uh, service providers. We have trade associations like the Truckers Association, the Hospitality Association. I mean, there's all kinds of groups you would never think of that the beer wholesalers, the people who deliver beers to restaurants and, you know, in, in bars and things like that might come come in contact and see human trafficking. So we have lots of trade associations who've joined. We've had faith based groups. We have civic groups that join. We've had individuals join this task force and the task force helps us not just come up with policies that uh, allow us to go to the General Assembly and suggest laws be passed to further 
refine the, the human trafficking statutes that allow us to go out and stop it. Um, but it allows us to identify other needs that might fall outside the realm of, of the General Assembly. As it relates to the General Assembly, uh, a lot of the recommendations that the General Assembly has taken and passed came from the State Human Trafficking Task Force. Um, two years ago, South Carolina um, was ranked number one in the country. Let me say this again, number one in the country on pro or I should say anti-human trafficking laws, meaning laws that combat human trafficking. We were ranked number one for laws passed by our state legislatures and signed by the governor. And those came from the, the collaborative efforts of members of our task force working with members of the General Assembly and members of our staff. So we're really proud of the role that we played in that in, in raising awareness. In addition to a state task force, we, uh, we created nine regional task force that, 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 that are more regionalized. There's one here in Richland County, in fact, that this Rotary Club or members, individual members can be part of. Um, we're, we're, we plan on opening another regional task force in the PD later this year. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm giving you kind of the overview of the human trafficking uh, task force and what it does. But let me talk a little bit about some things that we just uh, one of the mandates of the task force is every year we're to submit a report, a human trafficking report to the governor and the General Assembly on the state of where South Carolina is in human trafficking. And we collect data from law enforcement agencies, federal, state, and local government agencies. We also collect um, data from a number of our federal partners, like the Polaris Project. If you go to polarisproject.org, uh, you can see a lot of these stats there. But Polaris, polarisproject.org operates the National Human Trafficking Hotline which is a hotline that people that we use to collect tips. So if you're thinking, for, forget about law enforcement statistics, just people calling to give tips. Um, last year, the Human Trafficking Task Force, I think we had about 139 tips that were reported, which is down from about 156 the year before. That's 139 times that somebody called to give a tip about they thought they saw human trafficking occurring in South Carolina. Um, you know, so that that's important. And I'm going to talk about what we learned from that in just a minute. But on the criminal justice side, in 2020, we had 10 different defendants charged with 13 counts of human trafficking in our state. We had uh, eight charges of human trafficking were closed in state courts in 2020. As of right now, as of the printing of this report, rather, there were seven, there are currently 75 human trafficking cases pending in South Carolina courts today. Now, when you go off those uh, that, that data, the top five counties for reporting human trafficking. These are where people pick, someone picked up the phone and called to say, hey, I think I saw something that uh, might be human trafficking. Uh, the top five counties, and let me say this before I tell you the top five counties. I said this last year and I, I had some like chamber of commerce groups call me up and say, hey man, um, you, you didn't get, you know, this, this makes us look bad or whatever. And I said, well, let me, let me explain it this way. Your county is where there's more awareness, more people are aware of this number, more people are reporting. Just because other counties don't have as many reports doesn't mean there's no human trafficking occurring. It's like if we took all the highway patrol officers off the, off the highways of South Carolina for a week, the, 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 the reports of traffic uh, violations would go down significantly. That doesn't mean people aren't speeding or driving drunk or committing other traffic violations. It means no one's reporting it or no one's catching it. Well, through the Polaris hotline, we were able to track this data. The top five counties by that hotline are for the second year in a row at first place, Horry County, no surprise there, heavy tourism, uh, Charleston, uh, Greenville at number three, Richland at number four, Anderson at number five. Um, the top, just to give you an idea of the top five sex trafficking venues um, that, that we receive from these tips, these would be illicit, uh, illicit massage or spa businesses, hotel or motel based businesses, uh, businesses uh, like residence-based sex businesses. That'd be like someone running a brothel out of their home. Um, pornography shops uh, is another venue. Escort and delivery services. Um, now, sex trafficking is one thing. Labor trafficking is another. Um, our top five labor trafficking, trafficking venues uh, this past year would have been in the hospitality industry, the construction industry, uh, traveling sales crews, agriculture, you know, a lot, a lot of agribusiness in rural areas. Um, so that you might have a lot of undocumented folks working in those industries, uh, and restaurant and food service. And again, almost every one of these industries has a, an association or a group that represents them working on our task force. So we're incredibly grateful to these industries for their, their support. But this is where we're seeing a lot of the labor trafficking. Now, this is one that a lot of people don't think about. Most people think of a human trafficker 
is someone who's part of a, like if you think of the movie Taken with Liam Neeson, you know, you got like this European crime syndicate that kidnaps, you know, American girls backpacking with their friends to Europe. But the, the top five relationships that victims have to a trafficker would be an employer relationship, someone who's, who's employed them, an intimate partner, could be a spouse, a family member, it could be a sibling, an aunt, an uncle, a parent. Um, so like employer, intimate partner, family member, the recruiter who recruited into the lifestyle or possibly they're uh, a, a drug dealer or an illicit substance provider. Uh, but, but the top three are people who have an intimate relationship with the victim. So it's not like the guy in the black ski mask snatching the snatch and grab in the van that you see in Hollywood movies, but it's, it's someone with, uh, with a personal relationship. Um, so the, these are some of the statistics we're, we're picking up. Eight methods of recruit, the top eight methods of recruitment, um, job offers or ads, or what we're seeing in the report, also familial relationships. Again, that ties back to what I just said a minute ago. Intimate partner, someone posing as a benefactor. Hey, do you want to be a model? If you come over to my studio, I can probably get, set you up with a modeling gig. You know, you're very good looking. A lot of a lot of young people fall into that. Uh, people um, doing it through fraud or, or false promises. And then you have your abduction scenarios or your coercion scenario, uh, scenarios or something that might be related to smuggling, someone that's being smuggled into the country and smuggled to South Carolina, uh, but might turn into a, a type of trafficking situation. So these are just some of the stats that we've, we've picked up. A couple of anecdotal, um, a couple of anecdotal stories. Um, and, and these are just anecdotal to illustrate a point. Uh, a number of years ago, several years ago, there was a national story out. I don't remember the name of the airline. I don't think the airline wanted to be identified, although I think they should be identified because it was a good thing. But a flight attendant on a cross-country flight was serving drinks, uh, and there was a, an older gentleman. I shouldn't call him a gentleman, but there was an older man and a younger girl sitting in, in, a, in the seat. And every time this wait, uh, flight attendant would walk by them, she would always ask, uh, you know, can I get you a beverage? Can I get, get, do anything for you? And the, the girl would never make eye contact. She stared at the floor the entire time. The man would always speak for her. And if the girl even looked up, the guy would kind of, you know, hush her down a little bit. There was something just really off about this. And, and the, the flight attendant noticed this throughout the entire flight. This something did not seem right. And she saw the girl getting up to go to the lavatory at the front of the plane. So she, she went into the lavatory, put a sticky note on the mirror asking, are you okay? Do you need any help? Um, and left a pin there. Uh, the girl went into the lavatory, came out of the lavatory moments later, the flight attendant checked the note and the girl had indicated on the sticky note that she was in fact being forced on this flight against her will and was being flown across country uh, to be forced in, into some type of labor or sex trade. And, and so the flight attendant was able to tell the pilots who were able to call ahead and who um, were then when they, when they landed and they docked at the, 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 the landing area, they were able to, um, at the bridge, they were able to intercept that guy and separate him from the girl, and he was actually doing exactly what the girl said. So that, that's a success story. I was with a pastor uh, here in Columbia last year in, in Northeast, and he was telling the story about how he was walking. I was speaking at his church. He was telling a story, walking into the grocery store and sees a man and a woman in a car. And, um, and I can't remember all the specifics of the story, but to say that it looked like they were arguing. The, the girl looked very upset. The man got out and he locked the car behind him as he was walking into the store. And he looked over and the girl breathed on the glass and wrote the words in, in reverse. So it would look like help. And of course, he was alarmed by that. And when the man came out, got in the car, he called the police. The police uh, tracked down the car. And I, I don't know the outcome of the story, but that was one of those situations where you know, people who were seeing something that didn't make sense or didn't, you know, they, they saw something that didn't add up, they reported it and, and let, let, let law enforcement make the determination if it needed further investigation or, or correction. So these are just a couple of stories. The last story I will share with you is a story from an actual human trafficking survivor from the late 80s who, and I'm going to give you the short version of the story. And then Mary, I think we'll, we'll go to Q&A because I think I've, I've gone a little bit longer, but um, the short version of the story is young girl growing up in a middle class Catholic family in Michigan in the late 1980s, early 90s, uh, basically is given a ride home by a boy who she kind of had a crush on. The boy uh, takes her into a house, offers her a drink, uh, like a Coke or something, and she drinks a soft drink and wakes up several hours later, uh, having obviously been roofied. She was knocked out and he was nowhere to be found. 
She calls some friends to pick her up. Uh, they pick her up, drive her home. She never says anything to her family because she knew that she knew that she had been raped because she woke up not wearing any clothes. Um, but she didn't want to say anything because she was embarrassed, ashamed. She's 15 years old. She, you know, obviously her parents were very strict Catholics and told her, you know, about the birds and the bees and said, if we ever find out you're engaging in this, you'll be you'll be disciplined. Of course, she didn't know how to reconcile that with the fact that she had been abused being at a young age, but a few days later, this, this high school kid approaches her at her locker, hands her a brown, this is, this is before the age of the internet, hands her an envelope, she opens it, and there are Polaroids of him and several friends abusing her while she lay unconscious, uh, assaulting her, and, and basically to use those pictures as blackmail to force her into basically becoming a sex slave in high school for two years, um, and there's a lot more to the story than those facts, but and she even wrote a book about it called The Slave Across the Street. Um, but, but, and she got out of the lifestyle. And that's another story. But to I tell you that story to illustrate this. She was not backpacking through Europe. She was an upper middle class family. She slept in her bed every night. She went to class. She went to church. Everything was normal. But at the same time, she, she was being trafficked. She, she was, you know, a modern day slave for sex trafficking purposes. And, uh, but no one knew it. And, and, she, and, and of course she was manipulated. Uh, so that kind of breaks the stereotype of, the trafficker was a classmate, a high school student. He wasn't like in the Russian mafia, like in a James Bond movie. Um, and, and honestly, our first human trafficking case was just a couple trafficking a, a, an undocumented Latino woman and her two-year-old uh, in their apartment up in Greenville a couple of years ago. So wasn't, wasn't crime, wasn't criminal syndicates, wasn't organized crime. It was just people in the community trafficking other people in the community, in our community. So um, this is a real serious issue in South Carolina. I don't want to understate it or overstate it, but I'll only to say that there are stereotypes that need to be broken about what human trafficking is and what it isn't and what we can do to help stop and curb it. So I've, I've given you guys, I've kind of blasted y'all in the face with a fire hose of information. Um, and and I'll, I'm happy to uh, take questions, but I will say this, and, and Mary, I'll offer this up. I don't know who's moderating or Don, Donald, whoever is, but, um, the um, if you are interested in having someone from my office, whether it's me or whether it's our executive director, Catherine, or one of our prosecutors to come in. Um, and I think I saw Don Zelenka, uh, who's a Rotarian here in Columbia. I think I saw him up there a little while ago. He, the, the, this all falls under his division. Uh, but our office will provide you subject matter experts from a law enforcement or a victim services standpoint. Um, to come in and do a full presentation to your individual rotary groups if you ever want us to do that. Uh, we can't talk about this enough because we just want to raise awareness and we want to bring everyone in the fold and make you ambassadors on, on spreading uh, the news of what's going on and how, what people can do, but also make you foot soldiers in the war against human trafficking by helping us raise awareness. So um, I'm happy to uh, take, I'm, I'm seeing the chat room light up. Um, I haven't read the questions yet. Does somebody want to moderate those questions for me? Yes, sir. Thank you for your presentation. Thanks for sharing that information. Um, I will call out these questions to you. So um, viewers, if you have a question for Alan, please post it in the chat box now. All right. How would we recognize someone who is being trafficked? Are there signs to look for? Well, abs well, ab well first off, I, I, I told you two anecdotal stories to illustrate um, human let me say one other thing. I didn't say this in my main remarks, and this is part of this question. I've talked to survivors of human trafficking who have told me that they did not realize they were human trafficking victims uh, when they were being victimized. You think, think of a young woman who gets in a relationship, like a 15, 16-year-old girl who has a bad home life or is somehow gets and falls in with a bad group of people, and um, she starts dating a guy and ends up running away from home or leaving home and living with the guy. And the guy says, I love you, baby. I'm going to marry you. And she's madly in love with him. She's there of her own free will. And he says, hey, listen, we got to pay the bills. And so he says, I need you to sell marijuana. I need you to sell these drugs or these, you know, Oxycontin or these illicit drugs or whatever the case may be to help us pay the bills. And he says, we got to make so much money a week. And all of a sudden, one day she shows up and she hasn't been able to sell enough drugs. He's like, listen, baby, in order for me to be able to marry you and build a family life with you, I need you to uh, make the, make the, help me make the rent. And if you can't do it, um, with selling drugs, I need you to do it other ways. And because she's in love with him and because he kind of has got so much influence, she's completely and totally dependent on him. She starts allowing herself to engage in this type of conduct. And this goes on for days, weeks, months, and some, in some cases years, he might even get her pregnant or have someone get her pregnant. So she's even more dependent. 
And he's also got her strung out on drugs. And, and now she's afraid of the law enforcement because she thinks she's in the, cr the crime world. And, and of course, we call these people the Romeo pimp. These are the people that get the girl completely, uh, that the girl might be in love with, uh, or that, that woos the girl, provides, pays, you know, provides her, showers her with gifts and showers her with love and affection and attention, maybe things she's not getting at home or from her community, uh, and then gets her completely dependent and then exploits that dependence by, by pushing her into this lifestyle. And then you got the gorilla pimp. Those are the guys in the black ski mask, like the gorilla warfare. They, they, the snatch and grabs, the people that use violence and, and threats and coercion to force people into this lifestyle. But what does a Romeo pimp become the second the girl says no, or the second she says, I don't want to do this anymore? He turns into the violent gorilla pimp, is, 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 to, to use the street language. So um, a lot of victims, um, they look like they would, like before we created this task force, there were a lot of people being prosecuted for prostitution. How many of those women or men you know, I don't want to stereotype the gender, but how many of them were actually victims of human trafficking at the time, whether they knew it or not, uh, and they were engaging in other illicit conduct. So we might see someone prostituting themselves or uh, operating and being in an illicit massage parlor type business or working in a strip club. By the way, quick point, the, the, the girl from the Michigan story I told you who was exploited by those boys said they opened up a national strip club chain um, years later, um, the, and if I said the name of the strip club, it was one of those ones that you would see in probably most major cities. But the, the point is, is that, you know, a lot of those girls in those types of businesses may not be there or that, that business is being used to groom them. But a lot of these victims, back to the question, what do they look like? They look like surly teenagers. They look like people addicted to drugs. They look like people who are abused um, in, in another form or fashion, but maybe, but, but human trafficking victims don't look different from other things that we already see. We just don't know that they're human trafficking victims. You know, like the girl on the plane who's, who, who, who won't make eye contact, who refuses to talk for herself. That's odd. The girl in the car, you know, using her breath, the right help on the window, just someone in the parking lot looks, looks, looks like just everyone else. So human trafficking victims can be of any race, any gender, any socioeconomic status, uh, it's just, it's just that they, they're people who are hurting and who are acting out. And you may, you may chalk it up to something else, but it, but it may in fact be that they're being victimized by a trafficker. Are undocumented workers or illegal immigrants considered part of human trafficking if they're not indentured? Um, so I think I, I want to make sure I understand that question correctly. Um, so we have, we have, and under state law, and there's a federal statute that allows us to do this, that we can allow a victim of human trafficking who has been, and there's, and there's a difference between human smuggling and human trafficking. I don't know if that's where that question's going, but I think it is. Human smuggling is a crime against the country. That's where someone's smuggling people into the United States illegally, right? Human trafficking is a crime against a person. You are exploiting a human being and treating them as chattel, e either, either through fraud, coercion, force, fraud, whatever the case may be, manipulation, threats of violence, you, you, are, you are exploiting them and using them for labor or sex, um, uh, commercial purposes. Um, so th there's a very different, so you don't, so you use the word indentured. Like I said, there are people who are being forced to in, into employment and they're being coerced into it. Maybe they're afraid to report to the police and someone might exploit that fear by treating them poorly and not letting them leave or holding onto their paperwork and not letting them go until they do X, Y, and Z. There, there are ways to exploit and coerce someone into the lifestyle, either the sex or labor trafficking lifestyle. Um, so I don't know if that direct, directly answers the question, but you know, you don't have to be in necessarily indentured per se, um, but or know that or believe that you're indentured. You could be exploited or trapped without actually being aware of it. Has social media growth increased increased human trafficking? Uh, I think social media and the internet has increased everything. I mean, it, it's it's a force multiplier for good and evil. I mean, I mean, right now we're doing this rotary meeting through the use of the internet, right? Through through a platform, um, and as technology has become more advanced and it has democratized information, democ democratized our ability to um, communicate and recreate. Uh, it, it has also democratized access to other things, uh, the crime world. You know, there, there, there's a dark net out there. And, and, you know, obviously we've all heard of 
these online sites like backpage.com or, or all these other groups where, you know, you can go for the girlfriend experience or, or you know, an escort service. And a, a lot of times criminally minded people, just like law abiding citizens utilize the internet to, you know, you know, navigate the free market and use the free market, you know, criminally minded people do the same. And so, yes, the answer to your question is yes, the internet and social and or social media, as well as other uh, platforms have been used to, to magnify uh, this problem and exacerbate it. A lot of children are exploited too, uh, through the use of the internet. How do you get involved in the county task force? So, um, and I'm, I'm pulling up, we have a number of uh, we have a number of, well, these, let me go here. I'm trying to read off all the task force because I think we have people all over the state listening right now. So I want to make sure I provide y'all a list of the regional task force. If it, the regional task force meets once a quarter, but we have subcommittees at the state level, you know, it might be a victim services uh, type subcommittee or a faith-based subcommittee or a law enforcement training subcommittee or a, a medical services provider su a subcommittee or might be a subcommittee to uh, explore ways to help people leave the lifestyle and give them a bridge, like a halfway house. You know, a lot of these, you know, women are, um, they have no education, or men. They, they've been in the lifestyle since they were teenagers. They have no high school diploma. They might have one or two or multiple children by different people. They have, they might have, they might have a um, rap sheet. So they're not employable because they have no education and they have a criminal record and they have no way to explain why that is. And so how do you get them from, bridge them from that lifestyle uh, as a victim to that of being a survivor. So we have subcommittees that address and tackle those types of issues. Uh, but if you don't want to be part of the state task force and be on one of those subcommittees, we have regional task force. Uh, we have an upstate task force, uh, a Foothills task force, Richland County. We have the second judicial circuit over near Aiken. We have the Low Country uh, task force uh, down near Buford. We have the Tri-County, that's the Charleston, Dorchester, Berkeley. We have the coastal, uh, we have the Catawba area if you're up in the Rock Hill. We just launched one in the 11th circuit, which would be uh, Lexington, um, it would be the Saluda, um, you know, in, the, in that area and the, the counties that are around those. So, and then, and then later this year, we're opening up a PD regional task force. Uh, that is our next area that we're, we're gonna try to tackle. So if you're interested in getting involved in a regional task force, you don't wanna come to Columbia, but you wanna go and support it, it, it you know, in your backyard, you can contact the Office of the Attorney General, Catherine Moorhead. Um, I can have her information sent. Uh, you know, Mary, if you since you've got my email, you and I can um, I can get the information to you, I suppose, and you can um, blast it out to Rotary. Don Zelinka, who's also a Rotarian, I think I saw him on here earlier. Um, you know, he can help get that information out. But 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 we want you to have access to our task force. We can connect you with our directors of the regional task force or the local task force if you want to get involved. Thank you. Uh, this appears to be the last question for you today. Um, how are the courts responding when traffickers are identified? Um, well, so far, so good. Um, like I said, we have put on a couple of trainings, not just for um, law enforcement officers, but we've also put on trainings for judges. Um, we think it's important that the judges have a comprehensive understanding that when they're hearing a human trafficking case, that the effects of human trafficking reverberate throughout, not, not, not just that victim's life or survivor's life, but the lives of the whole community. And so they need, to, they need to understand that. And so I don't have statistics at the tip of my fingers, but I know that people who are prosecuted for trafficking are spending decades in prison. Um, it's a very serious charge, um, you know, up to 30 years for the first offense, and you can go up to 45 for additional um, I think it's a, a, I think a 15 year for add on for a, if I'm recalling correctly, don't quote me uh, if it's with a minor. So there's stiffer penalties added on if it's with a minor. So, um, you know, so the courts have been, uh, to, my, to my knowledge, uh, fairly receptive for those who are being convicted when the charges aren't, aren't uh, dropped for lack of evidence. But for those that do go to, um, for th those that do get prosecuted to, to their conclusion, the, the courts are recognizing the seriousness with appropriate uh, sentences. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing this very important information. Uh, we do really appreciate it. I know you're a busy man, so we appreciate you adding us to your schedule. And thanks for uh, joining us again today. And, and I want to make sure um, I want to I'm going to double check real quick. Uh, okay. Uh, Robert, you know the um, human trafficking website for our office. I think it's human trafficking.
All right, um, scag.gov. Uh, I'm going to my, uh, does, it's not popping up. We have a website. Uh, hold on, I know where it is. If you give me 10 seconds. You got it, take your time. It's yeah. human trafficking. Dot SCAG dot gov. Uh, I usually go through it through our, our website here at the office, not from outside, but it's human trafficking all run together. Dot SCAG dot GOV. If you want to see the annual reports, if you want to, th there are executive summaries of these annual reports. You don't have to read a thick book, but you can read the executive summaries. If you want to see where all the contacts are, if you want to see where all the regional task force are, go to human trafficking dot SCAG dot GOV and you can learn more about it and how to reach out and get involved. Thank you. Thank you very much. We greatly appreciate it. For those on the Zoom call today, thank you very much. We have also posted that web address in the chat box if you weren't able to write it down. So um, great presentation today. As a reminder, folks, there is no CRAP on Friday. And then for the foreseeable future, um, we will be on Mondays only at 11 o'clock starting next Monday. So CRAP is going to Mondays at 11 o'clock. Look forward to that. Uh, I will conclude today's presentation with the rotary four-way test. Of the things we think, say, or do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Have a wonderful day. Rotarians, we'll see you back on Monday for the next conversation with Rotary Action people. Take care, folks. That's a wrap. Bye-bye.